So I slightly changed the title. I switched from multi-party zero-knowledge proofs to relativistic um, to emphasize the fact that I'm going to use um, a special feature um, related to the assumption that um, distance provides a lower bound on the time it takes to send a message. And I've added another component to the title, which is entanglement sound, because what I'm going to describe will be secure, safe, even if parties involved use entanglement, which is allowed by quantum physics. Now, I want to introduce my co-authors on this work. Some of this work is very fresh, like a few weeks old. Um, so these are, all of these are former students of mine, although Luis Alva is now a researcher uh, of his own. So these are um, Arnaud, Louis, Luca, and Nan are my co-authors on this work. So let me start by introducing you the characters that I'm going to use throughout my lecture. Um, the characters are provers, they're going to look like criminals, verifiers are going to look like policemen, and distinguishers that are going to look like judges. Now this is from a, sm a small story I made up in which you can imagine that a prover wants to convince a verifier of a fact such that the verifier should not be able to convince a judge that this actually took place. Now, an example is if the prover um, was involved in a small crime, like, I don't know, he was selling drugs on a street corner. But the policeman is trying to prosecute the prover of um, terrorism. Now, terrorism is a much bigger crime, and the prover want to convince the policeman that he did not commit terrorism because he has this strong alibi that on that day he was selling drug on that street corner. Now, that's kind of a problem because if that information gets to the judge, he will be prosecuted for selling drugs. So he would like to convince the verifier that indeed this was going on, but this cannot be communicated to the distinguisher. And that's exactly the, the kind of scenario where zero-knowledge proofs are relevant. It's a situation where you want to prove something to someone that this someone cannot repeat to someone else. So that's exactly the premise um, of zero-knowledge proofs, and that's a practical example. So I keep the characters, prover, verifiers, distinguisher, accordingly. Now, as you have seen already, um, you by now know that zero-knowledge proofs are interactions between a prover and a verifier in such a way it's about a string w, and you want to show some property of the string um, so that through this interaction between prover and verifier, you can eventually decide for the verifier that the string is indeed part of a language or satisfy a property and so on. And this was introduced by Goldwasser, Mikhail Rakoff in 85. Now, this comes with two requirements. One of them is completeness. So for a particular verifier and a particular prover that we call the proof system, for every string in the language, the probability of the verifier accepting at the end of such a conversation should be really high. So I'm not being precise about what this epsilon is, but you can make epsilon very small. So the completeness condition is that it should be that the pair prover verifier that is given is such that when the string is in, satisfies the property or is in the language, you're gonna, the, the verifier is going to accept it with probability essentially one. However, when it's not in the language, oh yes, I have to emphasize that in general, in practical situations, we restrict our attention to polynomial time verifiers because this, I mean, this is a theoretical definition, but in practice, um, it means that we limit our attention to efficient verifiers. Now, soundness is that the same um, 
the same verifier for any prover whatsoever will not accept strings that are not in, in the language. So when W is not in L, um, it should be that at the end of any conversation that any prover can come up with about this W, the acceptance probability of the verifier should be really small. Again, this epsilon can be made arbitrarily close to zero. And so these two properties is what define an interactive proof. And again, for polynomial time verifiers, and so we say that the pair of prover verifier is an interactive proof for L if it satisfies these two conditions. Now, I'm going to be working all through my talk with the example of three colorability. So the problem of three colorability is that if I give you a graph like this one, the prover would like to convince the verifier that indeed this graph is three colorable. So what does this mean? It means that you can assign colors to the nodes in such a way that any two neighbors, according to an edge, must be of different colors. Now, the fact that this graph is three colorable is obvious. You just need to make these two nodes of the same color and these two of the other two colors, and that's going to do it. Now, it would be much more interesting if we had a much bigger graph. So that's an adjacency graph of the provinces of Vietnam. It would be a lot more interesting in terms of size and applications, but for simplicity, I'm just going to stick to this graph all through my presentation. Now, a traditional proof that this is three colorable is for the prover to come up with a coloring. So this has three colors, red, green, and blue. And the traditional proof would be just to give the tree coloring to the verifier. That would be complete because every graph which is tree colorable will have some, such an assignment. And it will be sound because all graphs that are not tree colorable cannot be colored like that. There must be an edge somewhere, whatever way you color it, there has to be an edge somewhere where the two endpoints are of the same color. Now, of course, the drawback is that such a proof is perfectly transferable. If I give to the policeman the tree coloring of the graph, the policeman can prove to the judge that indeed he knows now a tree coloring of the graph. And that's precisely what we're going to try to avoid using zero knowledge. Now, there's this famous protocol of 1986 by Goldreich, Michali, Vigderson, where they use what I'm going to call commitments to achieve this task of making the proof not transferable, or if you prefer, zero knowledge. I'm going to get to the definition of zero knowledge more precisely um, in a few minutes. Now, before I tell you exactly how the proof goes, I need to tell you a little bit about this idea of committing. So instead of giving the colors of each node to the verifier, the prover is going to commit to the colors. So he's going to give sort of an encrypted form of the colors in such a way that this cannot be changed and so that the verifier can choose to see only some of them. So a commitment scheme is a mechanism in two steps where first you commit, which is analogous to putting an information in a safe and giving the safe to um, the receiver. And the unveil phase comes later, and the, the person committing will just see the combination to open the safe. The person with the safe opens it and see what's in it. So this is a calc computational equivalent of this primitive. Now, the conditions that we have in mind is first concealing, which means that whatever the receiver of the safe does, he will not be able to see what's in it. Now, this is not quite true with a safe, because if you try all possible combinations, after a while, you're going to find how to open it, and you're going to see what's inside. So that's actually computational security when you put it in a safe, because there exists a unique combination so that when you open it, you will actually see what's inside. Now, concealing would be that whatever you do, you can never tell what's inside. And the other property that we're asking for is called binding. In binding, it should be that after the safe has been closed, it should be impossible to provide an alternate combination prime that will 
get M prime to come out of the safe, whereas M was really in it when you started. So it should be impossible for the sender of the safe to change its mind. Now, bit commitments are essentially as old as um, public key crypto systems. When RSA introduced their um, RSA encryption scheme, six months later, they published another paper, SRA, Shamir Rivest Edelman, where they used essentially a commitment scheme. They did not call it this way, but already they knew of the notion. Now, if you want to get a computational version, and this is essentially what Goldreich, Michaeli, Vigderson were doing in 86, they were using some number theory to do the commitments. Now, I give you here a very short simple implementation if you want to make, say, a commitment to a bit C0. One way of doing that is by using quadratic residues and non-residues mod a certain number n, n being of the same type as an RSA number. It's the product of two prime. Now, in order to do that, you get the person committing to publicly announce a number n with non-factorization and a quadratic non-residue mod n. And if you want to commit to a 0 or to a 1, you either give a quadratic residue, the square of some random number um, for um, a bit 0, and the square of a random number times this y. So there should be a c0 here at the exponent. Um, in order to commit to, uh, to a bit one. So basically, bit zeros are quadratic re residues, bit ones are non-residues. But under the assumption that this guy is only computational, he cannot tell them apart because it's a hard problem to distinguish those. Now, this is what they gave as possibilities, and many other examples were already available at this time. And this gave rise to what we later call computational zero-knowledge proofs. Because in the end, when you use commitments of this type, they're not perfectly concealing. They're computationally concealing. The difference between zero and one can be computed if you put enough effort on it. But they're perfectly binding. It's absolutely impossible for the person committing to change his mind because it's either a residue or a non-residue. That's it. It cannot be anything else. So it's one of these two possibilities. You cannot turn a residue into a non-residue and the other way around. So it's perfectly binding but computationally concealing. Now, there's this other bunch of people, Brassard, Chaume, and some guy, who at the same time proposed an alternate way of doing these commitments, and that led to the notion of arguments. Now, in this case, we're not only assuming that the receiver is computationally bound, binding, but also that this, the prover is computationally binding. Now, if you allow this difference, then you can turn things around completely. In this example, instead of having this, the prover um, make a public n and a quadratic non-residue, let's make the receiver publish a number n, a n and a quadratic residue mod n. Now, if you do that, now the prover can commit bits by either sending quadratic residues that are just a square of a number or multiply it by z. Now, in all cases, whether you're committing to a 0 or a 1, what you send are quadratic residues. But in one case, you know the square root of it. And in the other case, you know the square root once divided by z. Now, if you knew both of these things, you could factor n. So under the assumption that n is hard to factor, it's computationally difficult for this sender to change his mind. So this is computationally binding. But on the other hand, it's perfectly concealing because all of these are quadratic residues. So they're perfectly undistinguishable whether it comes from just the square of a number or a square times z. They're all the quadratic residues in any case. So this gave rise to um, commitment scheme with the reverse properties that it's now computationally binding and absolutely um, concealing. 
which was later called computation, computationally sound proofs, because now the soundness of the proof is going to rest on the assumption that the prover is unable um, to break a certain computational assumption. However, um, the proofs that we're going to get, the type of zero knowledge we're going to get is going to be stronger, which is perfect zero knowledge. Now, in, in my protocol today, I wish to achieve both of these, the binding and the concealing, perfectly. Now, if you have a single prover and a single verifier, you can easily show that this is impossible. It's impossible to be both at the same time. Just from an information point of view, you cannot get both properties. But we're going to change the model slightly, and in this other model, it's actually possible. Now, imagine that somehow you have an implementation for commitments. Now, instead of giving the color of the whole graph, you give a copy of the graph where every color is committed. Now, instead of bit being committed, I need trits. I need three value um, commitments for um, the three colors. Now, after giving the commitments to all the colors, so this is now the protocol of Goldreich, Michaeli, Vigderson, the verifier can select um, one edge. Okay, let me just go back here for a second. So, on my previous slide, which I should have uh, copied here, the verifier requests to see the two tree edge. Now, if the verifier asks for the two tree edge, the sender, the prover, is going to unveil the color of these two nodes. And the only thing the verifier does is just check that these two nodes are of different colors. Now, this is an extremely simple protocol. If the graph is tremendously big, it means that you commit to all the colors of the, all the nodes, and only two of them attached by an edge get disclosed. Now, of course, if this is all you do, this is still not very good. Because this, if this is all you do, and you repeat this process, so you commit again, then this guy asks for the 0, 2 edge, then he's going to find out what that is. If you just keep repeating, well, eventually he's going to learn the whole three coloring, and he can just repeat it to a judge. So this has not achieved anything, except that it's the right idea. So let's go back. Let's say we do it once, and we commit, we do it, but then we switch to a different coloring. So once you have a tree coloring of the graph, you can randomly rename the colors. So in the next instance, I'm going to name blue green, I'm going to name uh, green blue, and I'm going to keep red as red. So the prover randomizes the colors of his tree coloring, and that's very easy. And then commits again to this new coloring. Then if the verifier requests any edge, what he will see is actually um, two colors that have nothing to do with the previous time this edge was asked. Moreover, if you ask by randomizing again and asking yet another edge, what you end up seeing is a sequence of colors that are completely random. The only property that matters is that these two colors are different. So the verifier always just checks that two nodes connected to each other are of different colors, and we just keep on repeating this for a very, very long time. Now, what happens if the graph is not recolorable? Well, if the graph is not recolorable, whatever coloring you assign to it, there must be at least one edge somewhere where the two endpoints are of the same color. And whatever that color is, if it happens that the verifier chooses that edge and asks these two nodes to be unveiled, then he will observe that the two nodes are of the same color and will say, well, you're trying to fool me. It's, it's, it's enough. Let's stop now. So we're going to repeat the protocol sufficiently many times that every edge gets selected at least once, but even more that every edge gets selected a pretty good number of times, so that in the end, the verifier is convinced that there is no edge in this graph where the two endpoints are of the same color. 
So from here on, it's just calculating how many times you need to repeat so that the success probability of a coloring which has one bad edge at least is detected by the verifier. So this is how they did it. Now, this version satisfies the non-transferability property because if the verifier repeats what he saw to the judge, what he will tell the judge is, well, at first I saw red and blue on this edge, then I saw red and green on that edge, and then I saw red and green on the first edge, and then I saw what the verifier can repeat is a sequence of edges that were randomly selected with random colors attached to the two endpoints. Now, you don't need to talk to the prover to do that at all. You can just do that on your own. You just pick, you know nothing about the graph. You don't know if it's three colorable or not. You, um, you commit to colors um, pretending um, that you know a three coloring. Then you decide on a random edge. If this edge happens to be well colored so that the two endpoints are different, then you save that. If it happens that the edge is badly colored, the two endpoints are of the same color, then well, you just forget that you tried that. And that's exactly the simulation paradigm of zero knowledge. If you want to recreate a conversation, you have an advantage. The advantage to recreate a conversation is that you can forget attempts that fail in order to recreate a conversation. The real prover doesn't have that power. The real prover has to answer your questions as you ask them. And if he fails, then you kick him out. But the simulation paradigm allows the verifier to create a conversation by ignoring some of the attempts that he did. So this leads me to the notion of zero knowledge that you can think of not transferable. Zero knowledge is a very strong meaning to the, the idea of not being transferable. Now, more formally, we say that a pair prover verifier that is an interactive proof for the language is going to be perfect zero knowledge if whatever the verifier does, the conversations between provers and verifiers on some input x can be recreated by a simulator on the same input x where the verifiers of all types and the simulator are all polynomial time. So if for every verifier there exists a simulator that can reconstruct exactly the same distribution of conversations, then we say that this interactive proof is perfect zero knowledge. Now, in traditional literature, we have statistically convincing proof Completeness is perfect. Um, cons um, soundness is almost perfect. And then if you use commitments that are computational on the uh, concealing side, what you get is not perfect zero knowledge, but something you call computational zero knowledge. So computational zero knowledge is exactly the same thing, except that instead of creating distributions that are perfectly identical, you create distributions that are computationally undistinguishable, which means that if the judge is just a polynomial time guy and he tried to distinguish between is this a real conversation or a fake one, in polynomial time, he cannot tell them apart. But if he can work forever, he can perfectly tell them apart. So what I'm aiming for today is perfect zero knowledge while still having the soundness, which is essentially perfect as well. So that's not going to rest on computational assumptions. It's going to rest on um, relativity and the fact that distance can be used as a lower bound on the time it takes to communicate between parties. OK, so. So I have to tell you how I'm going to build these commitments um, that will give me all these nice properties at once. And this is what really my talk is about. It's about how do you get to prove three-colorability 
in such a way that you have perfectly concealing commitments and um, perfectly binding or binding enough that um, we can get to a proof which is um, almost perfectly sound. So let me introduce the other model that was introduced by Benor, Goldwasser, Killian, and Vigderson in 88. They proposed the idea of having several provers. So the assumption is that the provers at the bottom are allowed to, to know what W is at a time where they can talk. They can exchange randomness, so this is what I represent by the dollar signs. They can exchange randomness, they can agree on each one their own program. And then an assumption is put on them that they will not be um, allowed to talk anymore. So I'm going to say that a language has a, a multi-prover interactive proof if instead of having a single prover talking to a single verifier, I have at least two provers. It can be five, nine, 11, whatever. But for most practical situation, two of them are going to be enough. At the end, I will use one with three provers for some technical reasons that I will tell you um, in a few minutes. Now, in the paper, they said they want to give more power to the provers um, but under the condition that they cannot communicate during the process of exchanging information with the verifier. Now, in practice, how do you implement such a thing? Well, you can think of putting Faraday cages around the prover so that there's no electromagnetic signals that um, they can send to each other. But then if you, I mean, as much as you want this to be a very good way of protecting them from communicating, any one of them can just knock on his Faraday cage and signal through sound to the other one. I mean, it's very difficult to prevent people from communicating. Now, the only assumption in the end that makes sense is if you want to forbid them from communicating, is just to keep them far enough from each other. So you cannot promise they will never communicate, but you can promise that at least for a certain amount of time, they're not able to communicate. So they're making an assumption that communication between them is not possible, at least during the protocol. However, we want to satisfy conditions just like we did with a single prover. So we want to say that there exists a verifier such that there exists a pair of provers such that for every string in the language, the verifier at the end of a conversation with the provers should accept um, an element of the language with probability essentially one. So now the conversations between the provers and the verifier will be secret so that whatever is exchanged here shouldn't be visible to this guy and whatever is exchanged here shouldn't be visible to that guy. And of course, we're still considering polynomial time verifiers. And we want a soundness condition that whatever amount of randomness they pre-agree on, whatever their programs are, if the string is not in the language, the acceptance probability of the verifier should be really low. So we should reject almost all the time. So this is a natural extension of completeness and soundness in a context where you have more than one provers. Now, however, it turns out that giving a precise meaning to what it means for them not to signal is a lot more subtle than they expected back then. In 88, they gave a definition to it that I'm going to tell you in a minute. But it turns out that in a context where the world is quantum, for instance, this definition is not sufficient. Because when they say you cannot communicate, they actually mean something stronger than just not communicating. Now, this refers to work done in physics. If you were here yesterday. I've talked about physics and quantum a little bit. Now, this is John Bell. John Bell, in 1964, wrote a paper where he demonstrated that certain correlations are possible between parties that do not need communication. 
and that in particular quantum mechanics allows for certain correlation between parties that classical physics cannot explain. Now let me try to give you an intuition um, of the consequences of, of observing this. I'm going to describe to you the very first level, which is basically what John Bell called locality, and what um, Benor, Goldwasser, uh, Vigderson, and Killian used as a definition. They define what we call locality. Locality is what two people can do essentially on their own. Now, the definition of on their own is going to be a little bit more extensive than one might expect. But basically, if I give an input A to this guy, and he must respond with an output X, and if I give a B to this guy, and he must respond with a Y, I'm going to say that the relation between X, Y, and the inputs A, B is local if X is obtained by a deterministic calculation from A to X, completely ignoring B in particular, if the calculation from B to Y is deterministic, involving only B and not A at all. Now, if we just say that, then we call this a deterministic um, strategy where Alice, well, well the, the leftmost party um, uses only a deterministic calculation involving only A and deterministic only involving B. Now, to get locality, we also provide them with some sort of randomness that they can pre-share. So it means that they can pre-share um, a very long random string and keep it a copy to each of them. And then they can use it in um, deterministic calculations. So that makes them probabilistic. And every possible distributions relating x, y to a, b computed in this way is what we call local. Now, this is precisely the model that BGKW uh, used as a definition for the provers. Now, in the context where provers can use quantum physics and entanglement, this is not correct. It's not correct because there are things that you can do with quantum physics that do not follow this model. And that's precisely what John Bell was proving. He said, well, if quantum physics is right, let's calculate these things he called, or people called Bell inequalities. And if you can go above a certain inequality, then the quantum world can do things that this cannot do. So now let me tell you a little bit more generally um, involving this as the starting point. So I'm going to define a hierarchy of what I call non-locality. The hierarchy is that I give local people, so local people do deterministic things with randomness, but I give them a gizmo. I give them an extra feature that I call a correlator. If I provide them with a correlator that does nothing, then what they do is local. But if I provide them with a correlator that allows them to talk, for instance, then they can do a lot more. So depending on the correlator, this is going to define a different set of possible things they can compute. And so I want to consider a few correlators um, in, in that. Now, the very first one I told you about is for class locality. So everything that's local can be used, can be done from parties as I just described them, where the correlator is just the identity. I mean, the identity is completely obvious. You get A on one side, you get A out. You get B on the other side, you get B out. I mean, this is the most obvious, useless thing in the world. If you have just that, well, all you can do is locality. Now, on the contrary, if I give you the signaling correlator, you get A on this side and it comes out here. If I give you B on that side, it comes out there. Well, with this correlator, you can basically do anything you want. Now, this big class, the SIG class, is every possible correlation that two people can have. If you can signal, well, you just have one 
do is, I mean, they just exchange their inputs and they can compute everything for their, from their board of the input. So that will allow you any possible correlation from the uh, input to the output. Now, it turns out that there's a whole world between them. And basically, the BGKW um, assumption was that the world is either signaling or local. And the assumption they were making is that provers are local. Now, it turns out there's a lot more. In particular, just for fun, let's define a right signaling and a left signaling. So the right signaling allows communication from left to right, but the input from the right is just lost. You can define analogously a left signaling if this will allow you communication from right to left, but not the other way around. Now, these defines two subclasses of the signaling class. Because in particular, if I can do right signaling, and even if I give you as much of it as I want, as you want, this will never help you left signal. If you can only communicate in one direction, it doesn't help you communicate in the other one. So these classes, the right signaling and the left signaling class, are not as much as the SIG class. Because in the SIG class, you can communicate in both directions. Now, the intersection of these two classes is going to be quite remarkable. The intersection of the two is what we call no signaling. No signaling is all these distributions that are not sufficient to signal. So if I give you a local distribution as your gizmo, as your correlator, this doesn't help you signal. Well, how far can you go without giving you the feature to signal? Well, no signaling is exactly the answer to that. No signaling is every box, every correlator I can give you that you cannot turn into a communication channel. Now, how big is this? Well, that's an interesting question. It turns out that there's a very simple correlator that we call the PR box for popescu Rorli, who introduced it. This correlator has the property that if you provide local people with this correlator, then you can do everything which is no signaling. And this box has a very, very simple mathematical definition. The and or the product of the inputs is the XOR, the sum of the output. So the outputs are randomized so that any one of them, X or Y, is completely uniform, but it's the relation between them which is not. And so if you only see your own output, you're not learning anything about the other party's input. But if you see both of them, you, know, you learn everything. Now, this correlator gives you access to everything which is no signaling. And the green box here that I call local but with assisted with entanglement is actually provably a subclass of no signaling. So with quantum physics, you can do everything here but not everything in no signaling. <coughs> now, the yellow one I'm not going to even talk about. It's possibly the same as this one, but for this talk, let me ignore it. Now, there's an example I can show you from the quantum case. In the quantum case, there's this game known as the magic square, hence the name, the magic square game, where imagine you have a three by three binary grid. And the prover claim that the grill is filled with zeros and ones in such a way that the sums horizontally are all even and that the sums vertically are all odd. Now, if you think about it for a second, this is totally impossible. Because if the sum of each one horizontally is even, then the sum of everything must be even. And if the sum of everything is odd vertically, then the sum of everything has to be odd. Now, it cannot be even and odd at the same time, so this is strictly impossible. OK, why do I tell you about this? Because you can turn this into a, a situation that quantum allows you to win. The situation that you allow 
is that instead of showing the whole content of the matrix, which couldn't work, you're going to ask one of the two parties a row. So let's say this side, you give i, which is an index of which row you would like to see, and he's expected to reply the content of that row. Now you give the other guy a column number. So in this case, you ask for this column, he gives back the content of the column. Now, what are the conditions you want to check? Is that the row that's given should have an even sum, and the column should have an odd sum. Now, what else can you check? Well, you have to check that whenever, wherever they meet, they both give you the same value. So you're checking consistency between their answers. They're giving you two answers. You want to check that at the point where they meet, they give the same answer, but then you want to check that the sum is even horizontally and odd vertically. Now it turns out that this is actually possible. If you have entanglement, and you can read papers about this, you can do that perfectly. With entanglement, you can play this and win this all the time. So this type of correlation is perfectly achievable through entanglement. Whereas the best local strategy will win eight out of nine times to this game. So this is more than local, but provably less than no signaling. So this sits here in the quantum case. Now my argument is that if we do multi-prover things, we should at least be consistent with our view of reality. And our view of reality is at least quantum mechanics. So we should give the provers at least the power of entanglement and prove soundness of our protocols at least against entangled provers. Now, the rules of physics don't forbid no signaling above entanglement. Now, is this possible? I don't know. If you want to only assume relativity, you don't want to say the world is quantum mechanic. If all you want to say, you cannot communicate faster than the speed of light, is that your only assumption, then you have to prove things for no signaling provers. You have to argue that whatever they do that does not imply signaling is not powerful enough to break the, the security. Now, for now, we don't have very many things that are provably secure for no signaling, but what I want to tell you about now is how we can do um, against entangled provers. Okay. Uh, let's go back to the protocol suggested by Goldreich, Michali, Vigderson in the context of multi-prover. Well, in the context of multi-prover, let's say you have a coloring of a graph. You're going to end up committing to every single color for that graph. So you're going to create tons of commitments and commit every single node um, for its color. And then the verifier is going to choose, choose one edge, like say this edge, and you're going to unveil that. Now, this protocol, if you, if you implement commitments, as I'm going to show you, could eventually be entangled sound. But even that is not clear, because in order to apply um, the construction I'm going to show you, this protocol wouldn't satisfy that. But moreover, such a protocol would be completely impractical, because if I'm working with graphs with, I don't know, 500 nodes, there can be up to the square of that edges in there, I have to commit to 2,500, to, to 25,000, um, uh, sorry, I have to commit to these 500 colors before the verifier can decide which edge he wants to see. Now in practice, it means that the provers would have, in, in the context with many provers, the provers would have to be very far from each other, very, very far, like here in uh, Montreal, for instance, so that you can trust the security. Because you, you need that they commit to something, and before um, they can actually break the binding condition, the verifier announces what edge he wants to see, and they unveil 
all this before they can actually break binding. So this version of the protocol would be very impractical. So let me finally reach our approach. Our approach is based on a very different um, strategy. So there is a paper by Cleve, Hoyer, Toner, and Watrous in 2004 where they gave the most amazing simple protocol to prove tricolor ability. Instead of committing anything, the two provers, they just share the, um, they just share the three coloring. And then the prover asks one of them for a node. And then the prover gives the color of that node back. And then asks for the color of another node. And then that prover gives the color. So they each do not know what node the other was asked. And they proved that this is going to be sound. This is, I mean, if you do like that, if you choose edges and you ask them um, the two endpoints of an edge, they should respond with different colors all the time. Now, if you think about it for a second, there's a big problem here. The problem is that you can win this, you can achieve that by always answering the same colors. The guy on the left can always answer blue, the guy on the right can always answer green, and that's going to work all the time. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is they don't have to be consistent in any kind of way. They don't have to use the same strategy at all. So in order to get this right, not only should you um, ask sometime two nodes that form an edge. Now, that strategy will make it right all the time, so that's not so good. But sometimes, you should just ask them the same node. Now, they don't know when this happens. They don't know when they're asked for an edge and when they're asked for a node. Now, if their strategy is to use different colors all the time, they're going to be caught immediately from this. Because you ask them the same node, they don't reply the same color. Well. Too bad. So their protocol is still very simple. The protocol is simply sometimes the verifier asks for an edge and check that the colors are different. And sometimes the verifier asks for the same node to both of them. And if every time this happens, they answer the same color when it's the same node, and they answer different colors when it's two nodes of an edge, then by repeating this enough, the verifier will believe that the graph is tricolorable. Now, of course, we have to use sort of the GMW trick on top of that to make sure it's, it's zero knowledge. I mean, because if you just do that, then you can just keep repeating and see all the colors. So on top of that, you can randomize the colors. So if you randomize the colors, then all you get to see are edges where the two endpoints are of different colors randomly, or um, two nodes, well, the same node twice of a random color. So this is wonderful. This is zero knowledge, and it's an interactive proof. So why am I here talking about it? Well. Yes, but that they can pre-agree on. Yeah, so they pre-agree on how they're going to change the colors. Yeah. Um, this is zero knowledge, but it's actually honest verifier zero knowledge. It's honest verifier because the honest verifier is only asking for edges and for nodes. But a dishonest verifier can do something really sneaky. He can ask one guy a node and another guy another node to which it's not attached. So what? Well, if I see two nodes of the same color, then I just make a recollection that these two nodes are of the same color. Whatever color that is, I don't care. I just know they're of the same color. And then I keep applying this everywhere. I ask them two nodes that are not connected. Then I keep doing that all over. Well, by the process I described, I'm going to end up with three sets. All those of the first color, all those of the second color, and all those of the third color. I don't care what the colors are. I now have a three coloring. 
So if the verifier now is dishonest, he can abuse them, and even if they randomize, we'll figure out the tree coloring. So that is transferable. All right. So how can we now use commitments and fix that? So this is our, our fresh ideas. Now let me tell you exactly what the commitment is. Because the commitment that I use will have a particular feature that's going to be wonderful. So if, let's say, this guy will ultimately wish to commit to some value C, which he doesn't necessarily know right away. But in order to do that, the two provers, they pre-agree on a random value B. Now imagine that this is over a finite field, like the field of uh, 2 to the 100 uh, possibilities. But for the purpose of this example, I only need the field of three elements. So you can work mod 3. So your values are 0, 1, or 2, and you do additions and multiplication mod 3, and you get all that you need. So they pre-agree on a random number. Now, at the time of commitment, this guy will now know a certain value C again, a trit, a three value, a possibility out of three values. This is the value he wants to commit. Now, the prover selects a random R, which is not zero, provides it to this prover, and this prover makes the following computation. He takes the B that he had stored and shared, multiplies it by this R, and adds C. Now, if you think about it, this is some sort of one-time padding of, B, uh, of C using B. And the result W is what he's going to give back. Now, we can show that if B takes all three possible values at random, W will also take all three possible values at random. So the absence of knowledge of B for the verifier means that W means nothing about C. So the secret of B is what makes this W completely useless to figure out what C is. Now, this is going to make the commitment perfectly concealing. C is perfectly concealed through this W. Now, if the verifier wished to find out what C is at the unveil time, he's going to ask the other prover, what was B? And then that prover is going to give B back, and he's going to check that the W that he received is indeed is R times B plus a certain C, and that's going to unveil that C. Now, if they act honestly, as in this example, well, this guy is going to commit to C, and this guy is going to do exactly what it takes to unveil that C. Now, however, if they do not act honestly, well, if, if this guy commits to a C, and he wants to unveil a C prime different, well, this guy doesn't know how to change B so that an initial C will switch to a particular C prime, because this relation depends on R. Now, I'm hand-waving here, but you can prove that. You can prove that if this guy is committing to a C, the success probability of this guy unveiling anything but C, precisely some C prime that he would like, is not one. He cannot change that to C prime at will. Now, if you repeat that many times, you can make that probability very close to zero, the success probability be very close to zero. But I actually don't need this for the rest of my talk. So it's enough that sometime they're going to fail. Now, this is how commitments are used normally. Normally, you have one guy, he commits, you ask the other guy, he unveils, and then you can use that. So in particular, we could use that with the um, three coloring protocol of GMW. Now, a few weeks ago, I realized that this commitment scheme has an amazing property. And the amazing property is what I'm going to call the unveil via commit principle. You don't have to get one to commit and one to unveil. You can actually ask them both to commit. Now what? Well, let's say you ask this guy, OK, 
commit to the color of node N1 using string R1. So this is just like the previous commitment. I tell you which node I want you to commit color, and I give you a random string for the commitment. You calculate using a C, uh, C, which is the color of that node, and B, which is a specific B for that node, a W1 corresponding um, exactly according to the formula that uh, I had given here. All right. So you do that and you give W1. Now, if you ask the other guy to do exactly the same, you give the same node number, he's going to use the same color, and he's going to use the same B. And if you use the same R, so if R2 is the same as R1, well, something quite predictable should happen. It should be that W2 is actually the same as W1. First condition. If you ask the two provers exactly the same node number and exactly the same R, then they should answer the same W. Okay? But the strange thing is, if you ask them the same node number, but two distinct R's, now I'm in the field of three elements and I'm excluding zero, so one of them has to get one, the other has to get two. If you do that, then the two W's actually convey the information of the color. So you can get them to unveil a color by asking them both to commit to the color, but they don't even know that they're actually unveiling. So you don't tell them that you're unveiling, that they're about to unveil. You just ask them, please commit. Now, if you test the first case, you can check their consistency by providing them with the same R. If they answer the same W, you're satisfied. And then you repeat. You repeat, you repeat, you repeat. If you give them different R's for the same node, they will give you two W's that allow you to check the color. And if you happen to do that exactly twice, you can check that the endpoints um, are of different colors. So that's exactly the protocol that I wanted to show you today. The protocol is, instead of giving each them a single node, and ask them the color, you're going to ask one of them an edge, and he's going to commit to the colors of that edge back to this guy. Um, you can do the same with the other prover. Choose an edge, and he's going to commit back um, with the colors of, of that edge. Now, I use black and white here to represent the fact that you can ask to commit with some R or with the other R. So if, if two nodes are black, it means you requested the same R for both of them. And if one is black and one is white, then you requested um, with the two different Rs. So in particular, the two C3s here were requested with the same R. And then you can check consistency that C3 from both of them is the same. You can check that they're equal, and that's like asking them the same node. This will give you soundness. I'm almost done. Now, you can also check colors of an edge by asking them the same edge. So if you ask an edge to this guy, um, and the same edge again to the other guy, but using different colors, uh, using different R's, then you can actually check um, that two nodes um, and unveil the color of that node. So you can unveil the color of a single node, if you like, or you can do that and check the color of two endpoints um, by selecting an edge, exactly the same edge to both of them, with different R's, so that you can unveil the two endpoints. So this is the entire protocol. So what I just described you is the entire protocol. You just each give them an edge and ask them to commit. And when they give you the commitments, you can 
merge these two and either check they're consistent or check that an edge is well colored. So this is what the written form of the protocol looks like. You can find that in, in our future paper. But as for zero knowledge, we have to give the, um, the answer to what can a, a dishonest verifier do. Well, a dishonest verifier can select two edges, one going to each prover, and if they're completely disconnected like that, the verifier doesn't even learn any color. He just gets commitments and he can do nothing with them. He can choose the two edges so to find out a single color, or he can choose the two edges so to find out two colors. But that's it. That's as much as this verifier can obtain. And because of this, what he will see is either no color at all, a random color, or two random colors. So this is exactly what it takes for this protocol to be zero knowledge. So this protocol is inherently zero knowledge because the two provers will only give the colors of edges. So you can no longer fool them into getting colors that are not attached, and nodes that are not attached, because they will only answer when you ask them no edges. If you give a prover two nodes that are not attached, it's going to say, well, I'm not going to answer that. Now, just to conclude, in order to get the quantum version, what I, I mean, we can show that this version with two prover is sound for local provers, but not for entangled provers. There's this powerful theorem of Kempa, Kobayashi, Matsumoto, Toner, and Vidic, where they show that if you have any protocol with two people that is sound against local provers, you can make it entangled sound by adding a third prover. And the third prover is only asked to do exactly the same as the first one or the same as the second one. So you always have a third prover where the third prover is going to again commit but you ask him to commit exactly the same as P1 or exactly the same as P2. And when you go to that version with three provers, then suddenly it becomes entangled sound. Now, there's a lot under the rug here, but this version with three prover is sound against entanglement. So this is the written version of this. It's sound because of their result. And it's zero knowledge because even if you ask three colors, if you have three edges that you can sample, you still don't see anything that three colorable graphs will all have. These are seven ways you can sample three edges. And none of them has anything unexpected in it. You either see no color at all, two colors that are at an edge, or three colors if it's a triangle. But you know that if you see a triangle like that, you're going to see all three colors, and that's it. So there's nothing here that's not perfectly predictable. You never find out colors where you shouldn't. And that's why, ultimately, there's a whole simulator that can simulate even the three-party case. And just to conclude, this is being developed as a physical prototype by my friends in Geneva. Um, they had worked on a commitment scheme of similar nature for 24 hours a few years ago. And now we're implementing this protocol so that even at short distances of if maybe in the range of 100 meters, we can actually implement these protocols. And so we get perfect zero knowledge as well as perfect soundness because we can time the events. That's something I did not emphasize. But basically, if you have two verifiers talking to two provers, and if they give them the edge they want to see committed essentially at the same time, and the two provers respond immediately then it's impossible that they communicated before they answered. You just have to keep them far enough that the time from verifier to prover back is shorter than the time it takes to signal between them. And they're implementing this with uh, special hardware and so on. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you for your attention. I believe in the future we can rely on this kind of assumption to get even stronger security. Thank you.